Also, it is our distinct pleasure to recognize several members of the Tuskegee Airmen, their national president, Brigadier General Retired Leon Johnson, and most notably, six documented original Tuskegee Airmen here today. They are Gentlemen, if you'll remain standing and wave when I call your name, we have Airman Wilfred DeFore, Airman William Johnson, Airman Eugene Richardson, Airman Herbert Thorpe, Airman Enoch Woodhouse, Mr. Roscoe Draper, a civilian flight instructor. Please join us in another round of applause for the outstanding rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for honors, the national anthem, and today's invocation by Chaplain Donald Carruthers, Chaplain for the United States Corps of Cadets. For today's ceremony, the official party is Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin Jr., the 59th Superintendent of the United States Military Academy, Class of 1975. Lieutenant General Todd Semonite, the Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, Class of 1979. Judge L. Scott Melville, nephew of General Benjamin Davis, Jr. And Cadet Nettyange Minos, member of the Excel Scholars Club. Chaplain, I was an Air Force brat first, raised by a fighter pilot, and I heard great stories of the Tuskegee Airmen growing up as a child. It is truly an honor to be a part of this ceremony. Let me allow, allow me to voice a prayer for us on this occasion. Almighty God, long ago the founders of this nation put in writing their convictions that you created all people equal. Those words remain hollow, words on paper without men and women, but willing to raise their right hand and swear even to the point of their own life to defend the ideals of our Constitution and to ensure that these words can become a living reality. Today we ask your blessings upon this building named in honor of one who stood strongly for freedom, paid a high personal price for that freedom, ensuring that the promises in our Constitution apply to all Americans. 
We ask your blessings on the cadets who will live and sleep in this building and call it home. May they be influenced and inspired by General Davis's legacy to be leaders of character, ensuring our nation's words do not ring hollow, but rather become hallowed. We pray for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and DA civilians who are serving in harm's way at this moment for the cause of freedom. I pray for the families who wait for their safe return. I pray for those in this crowd who live with the aftermath of having served in harm's way. God bless our Army, our Air Force, our Navy, and our Marines. Bless our elected officials who govern this nation, including our Commander-in-Chief. And God, please, bless America. Amen. Please be seated. Our first speaker today is Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin Jr., the 50th 9th Superintendent of the United States Military Academy, Class of 1975. What an incredible day. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Distinguished guests and fellow general officers, active and retired, family and friends of General Davis, ladies and gentlemen, thank you and welcome to the United States Military Academy at West Point. We truly are honored to have you with us today as we honor one of our own, an American hero, a true leader of character in every sense of the phrase, General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. First, I'd like to extend a special welcome to some of our distinguished guests, the many active, retired, and former senior officials and general officers in the office today include the Honorable Catherine Hammett, our former Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations and Energy and Environment. Thank you so much for being here and the incredible role that you played. I'll never forget it. The building and get this building built. Our former New York City Mayor David Dinkins. Lieutenant General Todd Semonite, the, the commanding general of the Army Corps of Engineers and was responsible for the construction of this incredible building. Lieutenant General Najee West, the Army's Surgeon General. Lieutenant General Glenn Bingham, our Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management. And representing the Air Force, Lieutenant General Stacy Harris, the Director of the Air Staff. Also, Brigadier General Retired Leon Johnson, President of the National Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. Ms. Cora Spooner, our past President of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, and her husband, Major General Retired Richard Spooner. The Spooners have donated a number of items belonging to General Davis that are on display here this morning. And thank you both for sharing these pieces of history with us. And a very special welcome to the six living Tuskegee Airmen in attendance today and again Airman Wolford IV who's one of the group's oldest living members at 99 years young. So, uh, and Airman William Johnson, Airman Eugene Richardson, Airman Herbert Thorpe, Airman uh, Enoch Wood, uh, Woodhouse and Mr. Roscoe Draper. So gentlemen, we're so honored by your presence today and we are truly grateful for your legacy of service to our nation. So would everyone please join me one more time in Robert Clark. Thank you. General Hunton, sir, welcome back. This is one of a number of projects on post that you started on your watch. Thank you for your vision and leadership that got this project funded and off the ground. We all appreciate it very much. To General Seminite and the Army Corps of Engineers, and to Brendan Rafferty and Walsh Construction, thank you for your hard work and efforts that gave us this magnificent building behind me. It's hard to believe that just a couple of years ago, this was all pretty much nothing but rock. And now if you look at it, it seems like such a natural part of the landscape here as if it's always been here. And of course, a very special welcome to the members of the Davis family joining us today. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for your incredible support of this project over the past few years. We're all familiar with the story of how Benjamin Davis Jr. fell in love with flying at such a young age. And ever since that first barnstorming flight at an air show in Washington, D.C., he set his sights on becoming a pilot. 
But little did he know that simple boyhood dream of flying would not only eventually propel him into the clouds as an Army aviator, but also as a pioneer for equal opportunity and treatment in the military, as well as an inspirational example of selfless service and perseverance and humility. We all know his journey encountered a lot of turbulence along the way. Time and time again, he would face adversity and obstacles along the way, whether being silenced as a West Point cadet, experiencing racial discrimination, institutional racial discrimination here at West Point, racial discrimination from his fellow officers, the challenges to just simply be allowed into the cockpit to train as an Army aviator, and then the many challenges he and his fellow Tuskegee Airmen faced to prove themselves worthy to serve in combat for our country. But every time, Benjamin Davis Jr. overcame each obstacle with incredible grace and dignity, never bitter or resentful, and along the way, he earned the trust and respect of everybody around him. As President Clinton would say decades later as he penned the fourth star on General Davis, he said, living proof that a person can overcome adversity and discrimination, achieve great things, turn skeptics into believers, and through example and perseverance, one person can truly bring extraordinary change. General Davis exemplifies the West Point values of duty and honor and country. And he exemplifies what it means to be a leader of character. And in the midst of the internal divide we see in our nation today, there is not a more fitting way than to seek common ground than in the construction of this building as General Davis' character of a past generation will remain permanently fixed as an example and inspiration for today's generations and the generations of tomorrow. And now in a few moments, we will dedicate this new cadet barracks that bears his name, etched in stone as a perpetual reminder of his incredible legacy, an example that will inspire all future leaders of character to pass through the West Point gates. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, Lieutenant General Todd T. Seminite, Jr., the Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the United States Army of Corps of Engineers, Class of 1979. Well, General Caslin, distinguished visitors, thanks so much for allowing me to participate in this uh, ceremony today. I want to say to our distinguished guests, including the Davis family and the Tuskegee Airmen, I'm really honored by your presence and grateful for your service. Conscious of our young nation's needs for engineers, Colonel Savanus Thayer, the follower of the Military Academy, made civil engineering the foundation of West Point's curriculum. For the first half of the 19th century, West Point graduates delivered the bulk of the nation's public infrastructure, including its first railways, bridges, harbors, and roads. So is the 54th Chief of Engineers, but more to the point, as a proud member of the Long Gray Line, it is my distinct pleasure to participate in the dedication of West Point's newest barracks to the memory of an American hero, a pioneer who, despite tremendous adversity, thrived rather than buckled. Like General Benjamin Davis himself, this building before you will not buckle because it is resilient, sustainable, and strong. These barracks are more than a mere building. They are symbolic of what a noble army leader should be. Think about this building's cornerstone. It is the most important element because it is the first stone that is set in the foundation. And like all other stones are set in reference to this stone. This is a heavy responsibility. Like the cornerstone, army leaders must set the example of what right looks like. If leaders expect courage, competence, and integrity from those they lead, they must set the example. Think about the foundation. What it allows this building is to raise to great heights. The footings at Davis Barracks are firmly anchored to the bedrock of this sacred ground, just as moral army leaders are anchored to our bedrock values. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. The steel reinforcing bars embedded in the concrete to strengthen the structure reflect the army leader attributes, character, presence, and intellect qualities that must be embedded in our thoughts and actions if we are to continue to ethically protect our nation and secure our vital interest against determined and elusive enemies. 
As you admire the impressive granite used for this project, know that each stone was precision cut and carefully hand sculpted. Each stone is like a member of the Long Gray Line, a product of this fine institution, focused on precision and committed to duty, honor, and country. The mortar that bonds the stones together is like the bonds of loyalty that enable teams to commit to a common higher purpose, bonds that enable us to build trusted relationships with the people we serve. Look at the hundreds of windows. To me, they symbolize the transparency and accountability we must maintain if we are to remain worthy of the trust the American people have in us. As cadets for generations to come walk the halls of this great building, I hope they will think about the footsteps in which they follow. Our wise forefathers rallied for the creation of a uniquely American institution devoted to the study of warfare. Since 1802, West Point has been that sacred and celebrated institution, delivering commissioned leaders of character, warriors who fight and win our nation's wars. As cadets pass through this building, Sallyport, the majestic arch passageway, may they think of those warriors of yesteryear who did sally forth to attack enemies who sought to destroy those American ideals we hold dear, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. The cadets who will live here could have chosen any course of study at any Ivy League college, but they have chosen to serve in the profession of arms. They must, therefore, be prepared to fight across multiple domains through contested areas, all to deter potential adversaries, and should deterrence fail, rapidly defeat them. Finally, as this structure provides refuge from the elements, we know that the cadets who inhabit these barracks will, one day, also be called upon to provide refuge for the vulnerable. Years from now, when someone says they lived in Davis Barracks, I hope they will also be able to say they have honored General Davis's legacy with their own service to the nation. Whether they serve for five years, then go on to become leaders in civil society, or rise through the ranks to become a four-star general, I know they will be worthy of the investment our country has made in them. May we all be worthy of the courageous sacrifices those that came before us, like Benjamin Davis, made. In that way, we can unequivocally declare the United States leverages the strength of its diverse workforce of its force and believes inclusion makes our Army stronger and more capable. I wish to express my gratitude to all of our partners, the entire project delivery team, including the members of the New York District, the reliable contractors, and the support of West Point community. The Army Corps of Engineers is proud to have been a small part in this historic project, and we look forward to continuing to deliver for the United States Military Academy. Thank you. Next, we will hear General Davis. So how about a warm round of applause for Judge L. Scott Melville. everyone, how are we doing? Uh, before my dad comes to speak, I just want to share uh, one quick story uh, about the journey here with uh, the West Point family. Um, it was the morning of Ben's 97th birthday, uh, December 18th, 2016. Uh, I met Lieutenant Colonel uh, Doyle and he came here to show me uh, to bring back news to the family how the Davis Barracks was gonna be built and how it was to look. And at that moment, we were really uh, brought into the process and included in all elements and aspects uh, and have been really had such an informative and amazing experience with the West Point family. So as we stand here on the soil of the oldest military academy uh, on the 15th anniversary of Ben's passing, uh, in the shadow of a monument that will ever, forever bear his name, uh, I just want to take a minute uh, for everybody to reflect on the importance and value of these monuments and as the conversation becomes a national conversation that we continue to uh, find the facts and create the history and celebrate those moments uh, for the gentlemen and the people um, that were before us. Uh, although Ben had no children of his own, uh, he had an oldest and favorite nephew that he raised and mentored and supported uh, and that and that individual is the man that I call my father. So I, I just wanted to say a couple words of context uh, for everybody here and um, 
I'll let my dad uh, share his remarks. Judge Melville, thank you so much, Dad. be short. <laughs> now I look around this, this group here and you know I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut, the Brass City. Well it looks like the Brass City is here. <laughs> I'm honored to be here today to speak to you about uh, uh, Ben and this building. And I'm just so happy, I'm so proud to be here and honored because it really honors my, my uncle. Now, I have a talk to give here today and I could talk about Ben for hours, but uh, that's not possible because the time factor is prohibitive. So what I've done is uh, write a few words on a piece of paper, a couple of pieces of paper, and I'm going to read that to you. Here we go. From the time I was a child, Maggie and Ben cared for me as if it was their children, their own son. I spent many summers, summer vacations with Aggie and Ben, but I enjoyed one most of all, the first summer. That was the summer of 1940. Ben was a captain then and taking flight training at Tuskegee. Although I was only seven years old, I can remember, uh, remember it just as it was, to, just as if it were today. Our times together reflected a, say, a, a side of Ben that many did not know. Ben, Aggie, and I were very close, literally. We lived on the campus of Tuskegee Ben Institute in a dormitory suite of two tiny rooms. I slept on a folding cot in the kitchen, and Aggie and Ben slept in the other room. Although the uh, accommodations were sparse, uh, and crowded. It was a happy time for all of us. This is also the time uh, when uh, Ben introduced me uh, to aviation. One day Ben took me to the, uh, the Moulton the Moulton field where he was learning to fly and where I made my first real ride in an airplane. First time I've ever been in an airplane. It was a Piper Cub. Ben sat in the front seat and I sat on his lap. They buckled us in and uh, uh, Chief Anderson, the uh, chief uh, uh, instructor, uh, civilian instructor at the time, sat in the rear seat and took us up for demonstration ride. That experience was just, uh, inspirational for me because from that time on I always wanted to become a pilot. Uh, I was able to achieve that goal uh, over a, a long period of time after I had uh, retired actually. In 2005 I got my private pilot's license. My only regret is that I never got to take Ben up for a ride. He passed away before I got my license. Shortly after his retirement, Aggie decided that Ben should write his autobiography. He did this uh, and the book was published by the uh, Smithsonian Institute and entitled Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., American. In this book, he recorded or recounted his life story, including his time at West Point, the four years of unjustified silencing and the many insults he experienced as a cadet. 
But he was not bitter, he was not resentful, and it didn't deter him from his ultimate goal. That goal, as they all say, he didn't. It's the saying about the goals. You've heard it many times before. Keep your eye on the prize. Well, Ben's prize was to graduate from this institution. And he did that in 1936. Ben was a, uh, had served as a, uh, had served his country well for 35 years in the Army and in the Air Force as a fighter pilot, as a commander of the 13th Air Force, and chief of staff of the U.S. Strike Command. And after his retirement, as Assistant Secretary of Transportation in the Nixon administration, where he developed and oversaw the, the uh, Federal Air Marshals uh, program. He was a true patriot who died in 2000, year 2000, on the 4th of July. Think about that. What a fitting end to the life of a patriot to die on the God couldn't have planned it. During his lifetime, and even after his death, he had received many honors. But I know if he were here today, he would cherish this honor most of all. Not merely because it's a great honor, but because, and more importantly, because it was bestowed upon him by the institution that he dearly loved. Now that was the man that I knew, and that is the man that the Corps of Cadets will come to know, precisely because of, of this building and the history of its namesake, General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., American, full stop. Now those of you who are not aviators probably are unfamiliar with the term full stop. That was a term that uh, pilots used to uh, inform the control tower that this was their last landing of the day. They would be happy to know that uh, this is my last landing of the day. Thank you, West Point. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our final speaker, Cadet Nettie Ange Manos, who will now give remarks on what Davis Barracks means to the Corps of Cadets. Good morning, General Kasman, Lieutenant General Summonite, Judge Melville, Davis family, Tuskegee Airmen, fellow members of the Corps of Cadets, and other distinguished guests. Thank you very much for participating in this momentous event we have here today. Courage is a strength to believe in who we are and then take action in summoning the best in ourselves in order to help others. Maya Angelou said that courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. By this definition, General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. is the embodiment of courage. General Davis earned admission to West Point even as the institution held on to the practices of segregation and joined the ranks of cadets who did not welcome him. However, General Davis had a dream to become an aviator and he chose to set up on the path to his dream and change the course of many lives after him. General Davis consistently exemplified the core values of duty, honor, and country. He showed his devotion to duty by conquering four years at the academy. I cannot imagine how life would have been if there was just silence. I am part of the core, and I know the support I feel from my fellow core cadets, and that they want me to succeed. But imagine a core cadet where that did not exist, where there is a lack of support. Imagine a core devoid of camaraderie, full of silence, and this is what General Davis felt. 
General Davis endured such an experience and yet still worked steadfastly to graduate the top one-third in his class. Then he continued to lead the all-black division of the 24th Infantry Regiment and reached new heights as the commander of the Tuskegee Airmen, the Red Tails. Throughout his service, General Davis was determined to endure any ordeal to show the worth of him and his men. He showed honor by continuously fulfilling his service during a heated time of race relations in America. Davis's perseverance re revealed to the world that the human spirit does not break easily. This man, filled with passion and commitment, inspired change by breaking through color barriers and leading the charge for the integration of the Air Force. He constantly chose what was right when quitting would have been the easier option. Every day General Davis put on the uniform, he showed his love for his country. He chose to fight for a country where not everyone respected him. He chose to love a country that still needed to learn to love and value all its citizens. He committed his life to the country that fights for freedom and as evident in its history, constantly strives to grow and become better. I imagine General Davis walked the paths of West Point to and from his class in Berkshire, not expecting that one day he'll become a general. But every single day, he made the decision to follow his path and stay true to fortune his own destiny to set himself apart. He did not let his circumstances poison his view of the human race, but rather with every action he chose to rise above the circumstances. He led a life of service, seeking out the inherent goodness of man and not losing faith because of the blemishes. Those of stronger nature, like General Davis, take the insults and the snubs and the disbelief and turn them into the fuel that drives them forward, shaping leaders who are not afraid to stand independently. By daring to break, break barriers and challenge those who said he could not, he brought about the positive change he believed in and left the legacy to inspire others to have the same courage to do the same. This is the making of our great heroes and this is why he is honored at West Point today. Because of heroes like General Benjamin Davis, we are now part of a core that is an embodiment of all its members. We now stand in America in core of cadets that accepts diversity. We stand in a time where we value diversity as a strength and not a weakness. We stand in a time where as leaders, we must embrace and celebrate those who are willing to think innovatively and those who ignite and fire on injustices. Our army welcomes all who have the desire to serve this great nation. It is because of strong-willed trailblazers like General Davis that anything good is able to be accomplished. By fostering an environment that welcomes diversity, we are playing our necessary part in directing toward the brighter future and destiny of this amazing country. We honor General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. here today because his character is the foundation of the ideals that West Point desires each cadet to embody. We honor him for his inspiring career of military service and his devotion to showing that all people have value. General Davis is the proud product of the integrity that results from the alignment of actions with the principles of duty, honor, and country. The integrity and courage of one man, one decision at a time. West Point honors General Benjamin O. Davis Jr. by naming this barracks after him. As we make these barracks our home, I trust that each of us will live with the integrity of our home's namesake. I trust that we will honor the power of courage in women and in men who bravely chase their dreams. General Benjamin O. Davis now is carved into eternity. Forever he will serve as an example to motivate others to devote themselves to the ideals our nation was founded upon and to live a courageous and daring life. Thank you. Commander and Command Sergeant Major.
ceremonial ribbon will now be cut, opening officially the Davis Barracks. Those participating are Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin Jr., Lieutenant General Retired David H. Huntoon Jr., 58th Superintendent of the United States Military <coughs> Academy, Class of 1973, Judge L. Scott Melville, Doug Melville, great nephew of General Benjamin Davis Jr., First Captain Simone Askew, and Cadet Nettyange Minos. Please feel free to take photos of this historic moment. for the playing of the Tuskegee Airmen song and the Army song, The Army Goes Rolling Along. Feel free to sing along. participate in the following events today. The Davis Barracks Tours led by cadets until 12.30 p.m. There is a General Davis Symposium at Mahan Hall from 3 to 5 p.m. The traveling Broadway show Black Angels Over Tuskegee will be in Eisenhower Theater tonight at 8 p.m. We ask that you allow the Davis family members to enter the barracks first. Tours will start at the first floor elevators. 